All right, welcome back to the 13th biennial uh, Personalist Summer Seminar being held for the first time in Southern Illinois, normally at Western Carolina University. That has made some difference in the uh, regular attendance, although many of you have been at one of these before, um, and uh, maybe we'll be at Western Carolina in two years when this, uh, when this resumes. But for now, uh, we're going to resume our program on Whitehead and Berdyaev. We just had some Berdyaevish things and now we move to some Whiteheadish things. <laughs> and uh, it's my <coughs> privilege and pleasure to introduce my longtime friend Gary Hurstein. He and I met one another as we were both on our way to SIU in the year 2000. And uh, um, Gary was coming as a PhD student. It's a second career for him. Uh, of questionable uh, p uh, financial value, yeah, financial value, but <laughs> nevertheless, nevertheless, uh, you know, you've been working for Bank of Montreal, fixing their computers for, and he just said, "I'm not going to die like this." <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so uh, in any case, he graduated with his PhD from SIU in 2005. He had previously done a uh, um, uh, um, interdisciplinary MA at DePaul and long ago did his BA at Occidental College in Southern California, which is where he's from. Um, but not anymore, really. No, you're no really I've, I've actually here. lived in Illinois longer than I've lived in any state. I was gonna say, you're really from here at this yeah. point. Okay, so, uh, so, uh, so in any case, Gary is uh, my co-author on the Quantum Explanation of Whitehead Radical Empiricism 2017. Uh, and before that, he wrote uh, 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 The Measurement Problem of uh, Cosmology, uh, which was a, a book about Whitehead and Einstein uh, and relativity theory, which was based on his dissertation. Uh, I have to say that uh, I've, I've directed a lot of dissertations, and I have never had one that was as hands uh, that wasn't that was less hands-on than his. Gary would finish a chapter, he'd hand it to me, and I'd go, "That's good." <laughs> and then he finished another chapter, and said, "Wow, that's good." And then he finished another chapter. It's like no editing, no revision. <laughs> it's like, uh, because, because in fact, as you will discover, uh, uh, Gary is uh, really he's a very good writer, uh, and uh, by the way, he writes fiction as well as uh, as well as academic philosophy. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, but he's his own editor, <laughs> and uh, very meticulous uh, in uh, in how he puts his thoughts together. On paper, and so uh, for this reason, uh, it was definitely the uh, easiest. In fact, while well, he was teaching me <laughs> this this aspect of Whiteheadian philosophy at the time, so uh, I really appreciate that, and I'm glad that he came back to Southern Illinois after his various forays out into other parts of the world to teach and to take care of his dad and uh, uh, various other things that had to be done. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, today. Uh, he's going to push forward uh, the work that he's been doing for the last four or five years uh, on the philosophy of science in particular, and uh, this this is the language uh, side, of, think, so. yeah, um, side of that. So, uh, make Gary feel welcome. So, Randy was taking me home from the hospital after a two weeks day, a difficult surgery. And I'm mean, literally in the car, we're coming back to Southern Illinois, this was up in St. Louis, and he's saying, oh, and you're going to present at the uh, personal seminar at the end of this month, yeah? Aren't, aren't you? Aren't and you? I, I mean, at, the, at this point in time, the best I could manage were, were monosyllabic grunts, and not very many of those in sequence. Which I misinterpreted as yes. Well, yeah, I was going to say, so my response was derp, and he said, yeah, well, great, get your, get your stuff to me as soon as you can. <laughs> So, <laughs> so uh, I don't actually have a paper. I, what I have is an outline with some bullet points for me, because uh, it's what's going to come out is going to sound an awful lot at times like a cranky old man yelling at people to get off his lawn. <laughs> um, but beneath the po polemics or beyond or you know choose your spatial metaphor beneath the polemics, there is a legitimate complaint here. And my hope is that the legitimacy does not get buried in the failures of the presenter and the presentation. Um, so uh, I have this handout, one sheet that can be passed around. We're not going to get to this until the very end, so when you get it 
turn it over and don't look at it because that's cheating. Um, uh, so the title that I came up with was Learning the Scare Quote Language. And the first part, uh, thinking like Whitehead uh, to differentiate from Stenger's thinking with. Uh, and an example that if you've been around me a lot, you've heard me use this example before. Uh, if you're, if you're fami really familiar with quantum, you'll notice it's in there. Suppose a scholar presents themselves before this august uh, gathering and declares themselves to be a Greek scholar, in particular an expert in Plato and Aristotle. They are not just a scholar, they are a world-class scholar. But they never bother to learn any of that stupid Greek language stuff. <laughs> I mean, think about that for a second. Somebody declaring, them, I am an expert, a world-class expert on Plato and Aristotle, but I don't, who, who, why bother with all that Greek? I mean, we could legitimately, people in this audience, I think would legitimately be you know, covering their malice so as not to be publicly seen to snicker. Uh, someone like me who doesn't care anymore might become openly derisive um, because that's just the dumbest thing a person could say. You've got to know some Greek language to have any real appreciation of Plato and Aristotle or any of the Greeks. You've got to have the language. You've got to be able to hear or read a translation of eudaimonia as, ha as happiness and go, don't! I mean, it, it, that, I mean it, it doesn't mean happiness the way we mean happiness anymore. The EU, just that, healthy, well-being, daimonia, doesn't have anything to do with what we mean by happiness today. I mean, a human flourishing would be a better translation. And you can go on. Uh, the words that are translated as Aristotle's physics, it's not about physics, it's about, and it's hard, it's, it is about physis, but it's not about what we call physical science as much as it is about the logic of explanation. As physical science, it's just, well, wrong at the good parts. As the logic of explanation, it continues to be brilliant. And it needs to be understood that way, but you don't understand that unless you have some little background in the language. And I'm not saying writing, you know, uh, dialogues like Plato, uh, lyric poetry that competes with Sappho, but you've got to have some minimal facility with the language. To, you know, look at the first, you know, first John NRK in Hologos and see in the beginning was the word and you say that, that original, oh, it's not that it's wrong, it's just that it's utterly inadequate to capture the meaning of RK, the meaning of Logos, and just the beginning of the word. You've got to have that facility if you're going to be an expert in, in the Greek. We've got to have some facility in, in what Whitehead, quote, scare quote, and I'm going to get to why I keep scare quoting language. <clears throat> and this is the part that bugs me because so many Whitehead scholars refuse to get the language, to even try to get it. Whitehead was an algebraist. I mean, he spent his entire professional career in England, he was a mathematician, not a philosopher, even though he wrote the triptych while he was at uh, what, Imperial College. Mm -hmm. um, after, after his years, at, uh, after he'd retired from, after he left, he didn't retire from Cambridge, he quit in protest. Um, he was writing as a scientist two scientists, although he was also addressing philosophers, but he was not just a mathematician, he was what's known as an algebra. He worked in what we now know of as abstract algebra. And so just as you don't have to be a great lyricist in the Greek language to still have enough appreciation of the Greek language to have some real depth with Plato and Aristotle, you don't have to be proving fundamental theorems in abstract algebra to be sufficiently facilitated, be facile enough with, with the symbolism, with that mode of thought, that habit of thought, to be able to finally think like Whitehead. And this is the part that most Whitehead scholars, refuse, that's the step they refuse to take. And right up my right hand to any God you do or do not believe in, that pisses me off. Um, and that's gonna be where the polemic part comes in. Um, one did need to be able to sit comfortably with that habit of thought. 
There's that phrase again. Now, here's the thing about language. Is mathematics a language, properly speaking? You will hear people talk about, oh, the language of mathematics is the language of nature, yada, yada, yada. No. <laughs> mathematics is no more a language than if you took every language all at once, all languages everywhere at once, would that be a language? No, it wouldn't. It would, you, you can pick out individual languages, but um, it, it's, it's not, all language is not a language. Um, now, all of mathematics, uh, in the, when you get, do get to the hand, when you do get to talking about the handout, one of the books I talk about is the mathematical experience. They talk about uh, in 1880 they, or 1885, they did, or maybe it was a little later, they did a sur people did a survey, the number of mathematical disciplines. There was like maybe five major branches, 12 subdivisions. Uh, those numbers, have, by, within 100 years, those numbers had increased by over two orders of magnitude. That's by over 100 times. There are now thousands of subdivisions of mathematics. Mathematicians will literally have a community smaller than 100 people in the world to, with whom they can genuinely talk at their full academic and professional level. Fewer than 100 people who have any idea what you are talking about. I have, been, I, have, I have floated amongst a few mathematicians in my day. Someone at one point, and I believe this was while I was at DePaul, asked a question of one of the math professors. And the question, and I knew the question was outside that person's uh, area of expertise by a significant margin. And I just happened, as a, I wasn't looking for anything, I just happened to be looking at the mathematician's face as this question came out. The person literally, there was a fraction of a section, the person reacted with fear. Because they could no more talk about that other discipline than, um, than my cat can talk about uh, differential geometry. Um, and I, there's just there's this mutual incomprehensibility, but from one principles, you know, from one, one detailed expertise level of, of subdiscipline to another, it, they, they don't have any idea what the other ones are saying. That, that, that it's that expert, that detailed, that focused. But there's a second reason why mathematics is not a language. It, it, well, mathematics in general is not a language, but neither is. Uh, neither are any of these subdisciplines little languages. They're not language at all. Mathematics is not, of, at, 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 at any level, is not a language. It is a compression of language. It is not another language. It is a short form. And the expertise comes in that gets, keeps shortening and shortening and shortening those forms until the level of expertise to understand that shortness is the thing you, you need to go to school for 20 years to basically learn. And give you an example, um, it's, it's a matter of, dist of distilling down to the essential functional structural features. We'll say, I'll have more to say about functional structure, those are important words. Example I came up with, in, you know, and I wrote down here, imagine three mathematicians are in a room. They all work in the same specific, uh, really detailed uh, sub-discipline. And I mean, and I don't know enough about to, to pick out any some, let's say some area of finite group theory. One mathematician only, and their, their language, their actual language that they speak, one only speaks English, one only speaks Russian, one only speaks Urdu. So there is no mutual comprehension between them in terms of languages. But up on the board is a problem in their discipline. They will immediately go to work as a team on that problem. They may only, I mean, they'll point, someone will write someone on the, something on the board and point to it and might, might use word that the others will only recognize as grunting. Back to those monosyllabic grunts, <laughs> gotta love them. But they'll understand the problem, and they'll be able to work together, and they'll agree or disagree, and they'll, and they'll get enthusiastic about it, and they'll finally make it clear by what they write down, whether they, to what degree they, they, agree or they agree or disagree, how they go it. But they'll be able to work the problem without ever being able to say a mutually comprehensible word one to another. Because they're not working in a language, they're working in mathematics. And when I say a habit of thought, 
That's the thing we need to get settled on. We're not learning to speak a new language. We're learning a way of fellow. Oh, we lost it earlier. But don't pull. I think we're all right. Well, that just reset it. The Zoom may need to be reset. This needs to reset. Um, yeah, it, the gods don't like mathematics either. <laughs> Okay, um, because at the extreme end of comprehension, oh, I've already mentioned this, yeah, um, but they'll be able to work the problem together without being able to understand a word, a mutual word between them. They might along the way uh, ha yeah, learn the words for Russian English and Urdu for yes and no, yes, no. Um, some, they might learn this, this word, I don't know what it means, but that phrase is really, really colorful. And I should be very selective about who, how and where I use that. Smile a lot when you say that phrase, yeah. Um, and so that's the thing that needs to be picked up on. The habit of thought is different from, again, a language. So for instance, English, language, English speakers get into the habit of thought of, say, um, oh, yeah, when I was at DePaul, I did an interdisciplinary degree because I wanted to get a background in abstract algebra. And I'll have more to say about this and, uh, t towards the end. But, the other, but I only didn't want to take a math degree because in order to get a math degree, you have to first spend three years learning calculus. Nobody likes calculus. Mathematicians don't like calculus. They hate it. <laughs> Nobody uses calculus. The engineers, they don't use calculus. They use tables of integrals where they look up the solution to the problem they need to solve and go from there. But mathematics, as taught in college, you have to take three years, two and a half to three years of calculus before you can take anything interesting. And then they wonder why nobody wants to become a mathematician. <laughs> um, Your father's a mathematician. I took three, three years quarters of, cal <laughs> of calculus. I made it to calc three before I went, I'm done. <laughs> I mean, I, I, so I tried. I tried to do the calculus, and that's what persuaded me to get my, get my degree in philosophy. Oh, I mean, I just took out, I mean, it's like t performing seppuku with my pen. I, <laughs> the thing is, you know, you're, you have to sit there and wonder if this is right for you when it takes your instructor basically half the class time to try to figure out how to solve the first problem in the page. <laughs> and... But the point, but what I wanted to say was that the other half of the classes I took were actually in, mostly in philosophy. There was also some stuff on perceptual psychology. But I had the privilege, when he was still teaching in the United States, of getting my Hegel from Stephen Hulgate, a name some of you might recognize. Um, that was a two, it, it, DePaul was on the quarter system, it was a two quarter uh, examination of Hegel's logic. And towards the end, I got into the rhythm. I, was, I could do Hegel, and Hulgate was a little disappointed to learn that I was actually more interested in American pragmatism. But, um, but I was able to do, I was getting into the rhythm. It was a ha that, was the, that, that didn't change the language, that was a habit of thought. That was getting into the rhythm of doing Hegel, that is a habit of thought. Doing abstract algebra, and I'll, that will be my primary ab uh, uh, example here, because Whitehead was an algebraist, and if that's the habit, if you want to get into the habit of thought, of following Whitehead, that's the habit you need to pick up. Um, at the time, so I mean, so yeah, so doing Hegel, nowadays, I, I, I mean, I can see, like, I can read the title page of the, you know, the greater logic or the lesser logic. That's about as far as I can get. With Hegel, because that was, I mean, I lost that habit of thought because I never, you kept, I didn't keep up with it. Um, Whitehead's position regarding uh, abstract algebra, which might, one might also say uh, modern algebra, um, first of all, what you took in high school, that was not abstract algebra. Uh, that was barely al algebra at all. That was a glorified form of arithmetic. Um, and as, some, as, some, as I sometimes like to say to people, yeah, uh, when, they say, when they say, oh, I can't do mathematics, I can barely, I can barely balance my own checkbook. Now, that ain't mathematics, that's arithmetic. <laughs> There's a difference. Arithmetic sucks. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, Whitehead was on the cusp. Uh, his uh, treatise on universal algebra in, uh, from 1890s um, was still 
not was there was a big there was a fairly longish transition position period here, eighteen twenties. The Galois, a fellow named Evarius Galois, um, discovered what first became known as group theory, and I'll say a little more about that in a minute. Um, he wrote down his notes very hurriedly because he was in a, he was in a rush to go out and get himself murdered in a duel that next morning, and he was yeah he got over a woman that didn't even like him. Uh, yeah, yeah, he was just in, early early twenties, really young man. Well, over long developments, uh, the developments began accelerating. Whitehead's doing his professional work, you know. From you know, he begins his he, he first comes up at Trinity in the eighteen seventies, and if, and by the time he retires from uh, uh, Imperial College, by the time he leaves mathematics, uh, he comes to the United States around eighteen twenty uh, nineteen twenty three. The first text in modern algebra, and I could look it up, but I didn't think to do so because my brain is still kind of mushy. But I do remember that the first real modern text in algebra, in abstract algebra, was published in English uh, by a German, of course, um, or maybe it was Dutch, uh, in 1927. And it is so modern, it could still be used today. Um, so he's right on the cusp. And when we get to the, the, the handout I have is actually a series of readings for those of you who want to actually start to learn to think like Whitehead as opposed to just uh, thinking like the guy that doesn't know Greek. Um, <laughs> so Whitehead was right on the cusp. Uh, the transition to modern algebra, as Whitehead uh, argued, um, there's, there's a couple of things to do you know, here, is that learning the history of mathematics is probably the best way for non-mathematicians to learn mathematics. Uh, I came to this conclusion long before I read it, argued by Whitehead himself. Uh, that's how I taught myself, mostly how I taught myself uh, mathematics. And so when we get to the, when I do get around to the, the reading list that I passed down, several of those books have to do with the history of mathematics. But this is a point that Whitehead has said in his educational and his pedagogical essays. You want to learn mathematics, and you're, but, you're, but you want to teach it to a liberal arts people? Learn the history. Learn why people were interested in these problems how they got to be a problem in the first place. Um, so he's one of the very, and he's one of the very, very first that I've discovered who actually gave any emphasis to learning the history of mathematics. You go back there, uh, you can look into some place like, Pro like Project Gutenberg, and you can find some older out of print uh, histories of mathematics, but none of them are all that old. I mean, we're talking late, the very late 19th century, Early into early 20th century. You go back before that, nobody's teaching the history of mathematics really. They're just teaching mathematics. Some of this has to do with the enrichment of the field, that development where in 100 years, two orders of magnitude of complexification, suddenly the history became uh, important in learning the field in general. Um, the focus in, the tra in this transition to modern algebra is from what a mathematician would call a concrete uh, study, uh, numbers, geometrical forms. The abstraction in abstract algebra is taking a step away from these seemingly abstract objects to now you're no longer looking at numbers per se, spaces per se, uh, or such things. You're looking at relations among relations, what in mathematical language are called structures. And it is this move to the structural view of mathematics that this is the transition point where Whitehead is sitting right on the cusp and which he follows to the other side. Because that focus on structures of structures is even that is still is evident in the treatise on universal algebra. And by the way, nobody reads, the Whitehead experts, they, none of them, uh, I mean, even the first chapter of universal algebra, they won't even read that part where he does all the discursive stuff. Um, I mean, you don't need to become a master of, of the field because Whitehead can be a very frustrating mathematician to read. Um, it's, his, it, it, he's, it's the Victorian mindset. Um, for example, it's been suggested that the British mathematician, mathematics in Britain was held back for 200 years because the prickly SOBs 
were upset about the, con about the competition for uh, priority between Newton and Leibniz over the infinitesimal calculus. Newtonian symbolism is god-awful. It is appalling. It is unintuitive. It is near impossible to make any sense. Leibniz symbolism, it, 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 when you see the, start seeing the dx's and the deltas, and they actually make sense because they're saying the di a little bit of difference here and a little difference here, but the two of them together make this difference over here. And there's an intuitive nature to the, the symbolism that mathematicians you could look at, pick it up, boom, move forward. You look at Newton, he's got little, a dot over an x. Wow, that's really self-explanatory. Whitehead is still flipping back and forth between these two forms of symbolism in 1922 <coughs> with the principle of relativity. Maddening, absolutely maddening. Tell them what we did with Greg and Urich. Well, I mean, we, we were working with these mathematicians. I actually understood this at the time. Uh -huh. uh, but, but yeah, I mean, they were, they were, I mean, we were working, we were doing kind of a mutual reading group on uh, Randy and I on the principle of relativity with two mathematicians. They were going crazy with it as well. I was like, this guy's even making any sense. But um, they could put it in modern symbolism. In modern symbolism, but, it was but torture. It was yeah, it was torture and torture, uh, tortuous. Two mathematicians. Two mathematicians. One of them was an algebraist. So. <laughs> um, Whitehead in universal, uh, universal in the treatise of Universal Algebra talks about groups. Well, you heard me mentioning group theory. I s literally reduced myself to tears trying to find the group theory in his groups. It's not there. It simply isn't there. He's using the word even though he knows by this time that the word group theory has taken on a technical definition because he quotes the people who have given it that technical, that technical sense. Felix Klein, uh, you know, killing the others. Uh, killing is, is, the, is a name, not an activity in this context. Um, uh, by 1880, group theory and the space, uh, Klein gives a lecture in English in America, a series of three about group theory and how group theory divides spaces according to their different general, general, generality. Ten years later, and he's still using the work to mean something that he's just making up. Um, Gary, do you want to tell everybody what a group is? I'll get there. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I'm, I, I'm, just, I'm begging your, I'm begging your patience with this. It's a this. collection. I, I, I'm begging your patience. I will get there. I promise. I will. Um, I just want to. It's just there's some of this because it's, it doesn't really line itself up linear in a linear way, and again because my brain is kind of uh, a mushy fog for still because oh, I mean 36 hours of, of anesthesia and intubation does not lead to uh, your your sharpest. Uh, even after a month. Um, but anyhow, Whitehead is, is on the cusp of this, and he's starting to deal with structures in a structural way. Uh, so he, some of his stuff is, is actually, though, uh, still living uh, contributions to mathematics. He was the first person to bring uh, a fellow by the name of Hermann Grossman uh, uh, to the fore thought, to, to, the, to the front of mathematical thought. And Grossman algebras of extension are still an important area of study in, for example, quantum mechanics, which didn't exist at the time that, that White had brought uh, Grossman to the fore. Uh, algebras of extension, <coughs> still an example. Algebraic logic, which Whitehead was interested in, is not as big as it ought to be, but it is still a living area of thought. Um, so that said, what is abstract algebra? Well, I mentioned structures. I can also talk about functions and transformations. Let's talk about group as a structure, and I'll use my glass here. A group can be characterized, a mathematical group, as in the group theory or theory of groups, and I'll try to use it just and only in that sense from here on out. Uh, if I catch myself, uh, I'll try correct myself, and I don't correct myself, you probably won't have any idea what I'm talking about. Um, a group is a collection of transformations. And usually, oftentimes, abstract group theory, you don't even care what the transformations are about. You're just looking at the transformations and things you can do with those transformations, a way of bringing them together, taking them apart. There are three rules to group theory. It's closed under combination. A group is closed. In other words, if A and B 
are, trans are, are members of the group, the composition of A with B and the composition of B with A are, is also in the group. So, it's clo so there's closure. Everything has, everything has an er inverse. In other words, if there's an A, then there's an A opposite. And there's an identity element. Um, we can talk about these by, acting, by looking at A and B as transformations acting now on this glass. A transformation. That was a transformation. I just trans, or a, a, a particular form known as translation. I just translated it from this position to this position. Notice that that translation has an inverse. I can undo it. I can compose this translation and then rotate it. The composition is also invertible. That's all there is to it. Then things start getting fun when you start looking at, well, uh, finite groups. What happens if, the, you know, for example, if we, talk, if we add the rotations here, there's no finite limit to the number of rotations of this glass, all of which can be undone. What about um, taking a drink from the glass? I don't think that can be undone. It's well, not, it's not a, it is not a member of the group of transformations. <laughs> by which we're defining this glass. So we're not including the content of the glass as part of what the glass itself is. Next step, what the glass is, is exactly the group of transformations around which we get to call the glass the same. It is not the thing, it is rather the structure of transformations that leave it invariant under transformation. Maximal abstract definition of it. Mm -hmm. I actually wrote my, my, uh, my master's thesis on the, on the concept of identity using group theory. Identity as, as a function built around those transformations that contextually leave it, quote unquote, the same. Same here is, again, another one of those words that has to be scare quoted. Because it's only it's the same under certain kinds of considerations. What happens if they break the glass? I hope not. That's a Murano glass. Yeah, I'm not, I wasn't planning on it. But, I keep, but all, the part, all, all the physical matter is still here. And if, I, and if I allow glue to enter into the formulation... Would you use Harrison's glass? It's not a Murano glass. I'm not going to break anything. Oh, yeah, all right. You're talking about putting it back together now. <laughs> all right, anyway, sorry. Which is actually a Japanese form, art form. Oh, it is. And I don't want a wabi sabi morale. Wabi sabi or yeah, well, yeah. whatever, what, well, yeah. wasabi, whatever. Kitsuki. Kitsuki. From the man who just came back from Japan. Right. Um, I mean, does that count? Well, what is your area of what is your what is the consideration that's that you're taking? What are the areas that you're taking into consideration? For example, uh, in just ha just in handling this glass, as a matter of absolute literal microphysics, this glass is no longer the same from my, from my having to touch it. There has been a material exchange between my hand and the glass. Enough such material exchange going on over centuries, possibly thousands of years, that I'd that one would literally wear a hole in the glass of wearing mat material parts away. Does that count or not? Is that because that would not be a necessarily a trans an invertible, that would not be a reversible transformation. So just in touching it, it's not in, by a different set of considerations, a different context, a different collection of transformations a different group of structures that would no longer count as a member of the group. That would no longer be invariant under transformation, under that collection of transformations. But it's mostly not a very interesting uh, selection. There is, by the way, a different kind of mathematical structure known as a monoid 
A monoid does have a group at what's known as the kernel at the center of it, but there's a larger collection of transformations which aren't necessarily reversible. You, for example, are a monoid of transformations. Are you the same as you were 40, you know, well, some of you weren't around 40 years ago, but are you the same as you were, say, 15 years ago? By some estimations, that's enough time for every single cell in your body to have been replaced twice. That's like, you know, George Washington, the, you know, this is the ax George Washington used to chop down the cherry tree, except the ax blade has been replaced three times and the handle seven times. But it's the same ax, according to what set, what structural collection of transformations does it count as the same. That is the habit of thought that begins to take you into abstract algebra. Group theoretic considerations being among the easiest to first pick up. Um, oh, the structural aspect becomes, I mean, even I, you know, at times have to worry. I just quite by accident, I happen to have been, begun rereading uh, Halmos' book on abstract algebra. I mentioned that as is actually an ongoing area of research. And I, it's actually a piece that I've had to struggle this with on my own, um, in part because I've got too internalized with the standardized form of sentential logic, even in the model theoretic ver version, which I tend to prefer, especially around the idea of a quantifier. Quantifier, let's take the existential quantifier, the backward Z. Um, it picks out a thing, plugs that thing into a, uh, into a propositional uh, function, and you have a sentence that may or may not be true. There is an x such that p of x. Absolutely diametrically different from what happens in abstract in algebraic logic. Quantifier doesn't pick out anything. A quantifier is an operator. It is a function that performs a transformation on a Boolean algebra that is an automorphic, that's an automorphism. That is to say, it maps the al abstract algebra into itself to pick out a subalgebra that is another abstract, al uh, abstract uh, Boolean algebra. So the quantifier in, ab in, a in algebraic logic doesn't pick out things, it picks out structures. What's invariant? Well, it's going to vary from what structures are you interested in playing with? What are you going to treat as the same and what are you going to treat as different? Um, algebra, so the, uh, it's an operator that pick, and it picks out substructures. Um, and the habit of thought. I had a different set of way of kind of coming to a close here, I, but I changed it listening to some of the papers here because that habit of thought, um, you know, the, the last part here I changed uh, because uh, beauty and truth or get your priorities straight. <laughs> quote, I'm going to quote from that, uh, that Myron chose earlier today or the other day, but in the real world, it is more important that a proposition be interesting than that it be true. The importance of truth is that it adds to interest. This is Whitehead the mathematician yep. speaking. <laughs> this is the mathematician speaking. And I, I, I mean, I, when I say I can't emphasize that. Get off that, my lawn. Get <laughs> off my lawn. <laughs> <laughs> or start trimming the verge at least. Um, <laughs> this is what it's the interest in mathematics is aesthetic. A contemporary, a colleague of Whitehead's when he was a mathematician, G.H. Uh, uh, Hardy, uh, in his later one of his books, the yeah, the Mathematician's right. Apology, goes into great lengths <laughs> speaking about this aesthetic difference. I mean, Hardy is absolutely uh, explicit on this point. If you, set, if you set before a mathematician a formula that was ugly, the mathematician, there's just simply no way this can be true. 
It's just, it's not true. It's ugly. Who cares? I mean, I don't want, I'll have nothing further to do with this. Because, I, mean, it, I mean, the thing is that the truth might add to the interest, but the first thing that comes up is the interest. And that interest is aesthetic to the core. If it's ugly, I'm not interested. And there's no amount of truth that can add interest to it if it's ugly. That aesthetic de dimension is something that, you know, sitting with uh, the idea of, you know, the other day and letting it just kind of float there on my, on my own mind, a quantifier as an operator and, just, and, and feeling it. Re you know, I, and so, I mean, I go back and reread the same pages, you know, over and over again in the Hamlet's book just because I'm finally beginning to internalize some sense of the aesthetic. Um, beauty comes first, proof comes later. And Whitehead mentions this point several times. He says it in the opening chapter of, I mean, he doesn't say it quite that way, but one starts with the thing one wants to prove and not only later proves it, the proofs come at the end. One starts with the thing that has interested them. And he mentions this, talks about this in universal algebra at the very beginning, talks about it at the very beginning of Principia Mathematica. You begin with something that's interesting and only then find it. It took 350 years for a proof of Fermat's last theorem to actually be produced. Taylor, Wiles and Taylor uh, proof didn't come out until what? The night I was working at the uh, Bank of Montreal, so that would have been the 1990s. Um, Andrew Weil, I mean, people worked on this for 350 years because it was interesting <laughs> without any clue whether it was true. <laughs> they assumed because it was interesting, it must be true. It took while had to Wiles had to uh, lock himself in his yeah. cupboard for, in his closet for like eight years, yeah. and then when he was done, he presents it in three days. The entire room gasps, and within months, Taylor found a flaw in his original proof. However, happily for the story, still ends well because the, the flaw was easily corrected, and so it is now known as the Wiles Taylor proof of Fermat's last theorem. But 350 years, because it was interesting. And it also uses mathematics and, uh, that, that could not have been known to Fermat. Yeah, the Lyles Taylor yeah. proof uses why yeah. that could not have possibly been known. Yeah. Fermat had no proof. Pro Fermat claimed he had a proof. No, he didn't. <laughs> no, he didn't. He didn't know what he didn't. He probably didn't know he had. He probably didn't know he didn't have a proof. But he, there's, he, there's no way he had a proof. A point, oh, again, about the aesthetics. Hardy talks about the, the aesthetics. One of the things Hardy loved about his area of his discipline, number theory, which is basically arithmetic with spats. Um, um, you know, to, uh, arithmetic made really Tony. Um, he loved it because it had no possible, it had no use. It had no uh, utility in the world. Well, guess what? All of your encryption is based on these days. Every time you connect to your bank, your credit card, Every time you buy a ticket online, it's number theory. It's high-end number theory that's keeping you, that's, that encrypts your packets back and forth and keeps somebody from just stealing your credit card outright unless you forgot to use uh, two-factor authentication. I hate two-factor authentication. Oh, you better get it installed, baby. Um, it's it's high-end number theory that, that, that is, that's all the encryption on, on the... On, on, in your online transactions. Um, you know, the proof comes later, and I'll actually automatic rejection. Oh, for ex uh, recently, this would have go, this is back in the 1980s. There was known as the, the four color problem, in which a map arbitrarily uh, divided into zones. What's the minimum number of, of colors needed? And it was hypothesized that four colors would suffice to color every zone in a map so that no color was was, was intersecting with any other with, with itself at any point. This was proven, quote unquote proven, in the 1980s, but the proof involved computer processing, which they just brute forced their way through this proof. And they confirmed it by using multiple different computers, multiple different operating systems, multiple different programming languages. It's probably correct, nobody likes it. 
because it's, it's ugly. They don't like it. It's ugly. It is. It is just ugly. They because it into a game. Well, because nobody knows because they, you can't understand it because, you, because the compu computer goes through it and the mathematician looks at this and you got you know a million lines of, lines of code. But it's ugly, and so no, no mathematicians don't What's like it game? at all. No, it's a tabletop game where okay. you have different versions of the four colors, I and see. the competition among players is which one has which color is uh, the most prominent on the card, and I believe it's based on the four color. Yeah. Theory. So going so going back to um, the habit of thought. Um, another example I like to use: uh, jazz. Appreciating jazz music. You don't have to be a Coltrane or a Miles Davis to be able to appreciate jazz. But it takes at least a little facility with music to appreciate it well. I, I've got no, no appreciation for jazz. I'm much better at something like classical, uh, some various forms of popular music and such. But jazz, I mean, it, it, it just loses me. I just, never, I just never made the effort to gain that minimal facility to really appreciate it. But I understand that it's appreciable. But again, when I say you need to have some minimal facility with abstract algebra, I don't mean you need to become a mathematician competing for the Fields Prize. That's the mathematician's version of the Nobel. There is no, by the way, there is no Nobel, there is no Nobel Prize for, mathemat for mathematics. So the best you can come up with is the Fields Prize. So turning to the, thing, the handout. This is suggested readings, things you might want to pick up on. Um, habit of thought. Uh, Alfred North Whitehead, God bless him, his Principles of Mathematics from 1911. It's actually free for the download from Project Gutenberg. Uh, this might be, you know, instead of Prince, uh, did I call it, it's, that's the wrong name, it's introduction, introduction. introduction to Mathematics. I even was looking at it as I typed it down and I, uh, brain fog, I mean, 36 hours of uh, anesthesia, intubation, not good. Fortunately, you gave Bertrand Russell's <laughs> title. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah. That really is a Freudian slip there. Yeah, it was the introduction to mathematics, which is really, should have been called an introduction to mathematical <clears throat> thinking. Um, next one, Phil Davis and Reuben Hirsch, uh, The Mathematical Experience. This is a great book. Uh, they talk, they go into, they don't go into a lot of detail about different mathematics. They talk about the habit of thinking like a mathematician. They give some the backgrounds. This is where, for example, the discussion about how the explosion of, of mathematical disciplines, how most working mathematicians have fewer than 100 people they can talk to. They talk about a lot of different things without going into a lot of detail. I mean, the back half of the book, they go into a little more detail about different sorts of mathematical uh, uh, disciplines. But mostly it is about that, the mathematical experience. Big you know, experience as opposed to um, proof theory or this or that. Thomas Tomasco uh, edited a book from some years back also, New Directions in the Philosophy of Mathematics. This one is good because picking up with uh, mathematical experience, the shift in real philosophy of mathematics that is still not really taking place but needs to. For a hundred years, the philosophy of mathematics has been set theory done badly as though there were any way to do, of doing set theory well. Um, but set theory is not philosophy of mathematics. Set theory cannot provide the found, it is, it's mathematically impossible for set theory to provide a foundation of mathematics because it can't even provide a foundation to itself. This is a point that Jaco Hintico, one of my philosophical heroes, uh, it was, been, was emphatic of, about for last couple of decades of his career. Set theory can't provide a model to itself. How can it provide a model for mathematics? So uh, ex mathematical experience, new directions. What this is taking you to is understanding mathematics not as set theory, but as a form of inquiry. I originally came to uh, SIU in 2000 thinking I would write my dissertation on chapter 20 of, Gre of Dewey's Larger Logic, which is the chapter on mathematical inquiry. I got talked out of it. Well, no, wait a minute. Well, I, mean, I, I, I mean, I got... I wasn't I, the one who talked you out of it. No, I, I, I kind of talked myself out oh, of it. Okay. I mean, I'm not blaming anyone. This was, there, there, is no, there is no blame here. 
There's no fault we here. We both love that chapter. Yeah. But I mean, I, but I got more interested in Whitehead, so I talked myself out of it. Okay. Um, group theory. Herman Weil, who is a brilliant algebraist in his own right, and also a pretty decent writer. His book from Princeton uh, on t titled Symmetry. If you think about it, each of these rotations and translations, they are, in, they are a form of symmetry. And this is what group theory is about. It's about forms of symmetry. And there's symmetry considered in the purely abstract or symmetry considered in more concrete forms like this, this glass, this work of art. I mean, there, it, there's, it's, there are lots of illustrations. There's very little formal mathematics per se. But it's a good way to start kind of understanding that aesthetic dimension of that abstract form of thinking. Um, so I mean, all of, so I mean, that's a good, it's one to get, come up with. History. Now, I mentioned learning from the history. Uh, my favorite history is Edna Kramer's *Nature and Growth of Modern Mathematics*. Um, you know, so, uh, so, as I say, for my money, hands down, the best general history out there. So of course, it is out of print, impossible to find, and insanely expensive. I have a paper back on my shelf. I think it paid twelve dollars for it when I got it. It was still in print at that time. Um, Decades later, I went up online out of curiosity. I looked. I once saw it, someone asking $900 for a copy. I have since the price has come back down. You can get it for, uh, for like 80 or 90 uh, used. But I still find that ridic absurdly expensive. Uh, alternatively, Morris Klein, that's Klein, K-L-I-N-E, as opposed to K-L-E-I-N. Mathematical Thought from Ancient Modern Times, three volumes. Uh, pretty good, and like I say, you don't have to mortgage your firstborn child in order to get it. Uh, the mathematics of modern, the transitions for modern abstract algebra, Leo Corey, hands down the best book to be found on the subject. Modern Algebra and the Rise of Mathematical Structures. Again, it's kind of on the expensive side, I think $90. Uh, outstanding book, delving the origins that led from the emergence from abstract from 1820s to 1940s. It goes all the way up to the emergence of contemporary, what's known as category theory, a form of mathematics that has a better chance of offering a foundation of mathematics because it doesn't study sets and objects. It studies, guess what? Structures. Transformations. transformations. Okay. It looks at structures. It looks at transformations. And big surprise, it, looks, it actually has an, an honest shot at making a meaningful foundation of mathematics because it's talking about what mathematics is actually doing instead of set theory, which nobody but set theorists do. So I would strongly recommend getting that one in your library. And if you want to, and learning some abstract algebra, you got to stick your nose in there somewhere. Um, here I don't have any specific books to offer. Uh, I mentioned going to DePaul to get my abstract algebra without getting a math degree. That's because Math books are hands down the hardest books to copy edit in the world. Think about it. The copy editor has to be as good a mathematician as the author, and that never happens. So I was studying a very good uh, two-volume uh, book on, on abstract algebra called, of all things, Basic Algebra. I'd accuse the author of, of uh, having a, a, a secret s sense of irony there. But um, Nathan... Uh, Nathan Jacobson's two-volume basic algebra. And I'd be re studying the thing, and I'd hit a wall. And it's like, again, I'd be reducing myself to tears practically, trying to understand what was happening here. And I could, because it didn't make any sense. And I finally began to, began to understand that part of the problem was that I could be legitimately running up against a typographical error in the text. And I had no way of knowing it. Um, and so uh, my solution was to go back to graduate student and get a master's degree and cheat so that I could take the abstract algebra courses I wanted without, getting the th without wasting my life on three years of calculus that I'd never use, never get any value out of. And so I was able to do that. I, by turning it into an interdisciplinary degree, I got, uh, you know, took, you know, like I said, half my classes were abstract algebra and now the other half were philosophy. You got off their lawn. Yeah, well, I got them off mine because <laughs> I didn't take your calculus somewhere else, kid. But um, so somewhere down the line, you've got to stick your nose in the book. 
but understand that they're going to be a problem. So most of you folks are involved in some form or other, are connected in some form or other with an institution of higher learning of some kind, a college, a university. Go to the math professors at your local college and say, I'd like you to sit down with me on abstract algebra. Somewhere along the line, you'll likely find someone who says, oh, I'd love to do that over coffee. Uh, books to recommend, I'd say go up to uh, Dover Publications, type in the search window, abstract algebra. Anything there will probably work. But you're gonna, you might find yourself, if you're going to do it on your own, you're likely to hit that type, that wall of type. I mean, most stuff coming out of Dover these days has gone through a couple of corrections by this point. But there's still, I know, I can, I, I know from my own writings that, that those typos, no matter how many times you read it, the next time you read it again, there's another one. And that's not even in mathematics. So that's the, uh, that's the cranky old man part there. Um, in order to understand Whitehead, you have to get some facility with that habit of thought. And my complaint with the uh, major part of the, um, uh, of the Whitehead scholarship is that it doesn't even, even after you tell them, they're like, what was I just saying about prehension? I mean, they, they don't get it. They refuse to get it. They refuse to accept that they ask, actually work goes into understanding how Whitehead thinks. Because there's so much math phobia out there, in part because how it, I mean, that math is off, it has often been taught poorly. I, I freely acknowledge that, and they teach themselves poorly. Three years of calculus to get a math degree, why? Why do you do this? Why do you hurt the people who come to you with love? <laughs> I mean, it's, you only hurt the ones you love, but, um, you know, it's like, you know, the floggings will continue until morale can improve. <laughs> And that's what calculus is. So that's basically a, that, that kind of is what I had to say in any kind of organized form, and I realized it wasn't all that organized. But we don't have much time for questions, but Matthew has one. Um, I'll restrict it to the question that I think is going to be most interesting to the wider group because I see you pretty regularly. Um, you spoke on interest and being interesting and apologies to Randy and Ken for having to read the, read the introduction of my dissertation where I had plenty of thoughts on interesting things adding to the whole. Um, but you, Gary, know my thoughts on novelty as well. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could say a little bit about what you view as the relation between interest and the interesting from a mathematical or functional perspective and novelty, especially um, in a white head. Well, it's good. Well, the novelty, a novel idea in, in mathematics is going to it will will stir up a great deal of interest, especially if there if there's something that something that looks that look that's pretty. Um, there's a, there's an article that I that some that I will ne probably never reach, but basically the, the title of the article is are ways of mathematical metaphor. Uh, metaphor plays a great role in the growth of novelty in mathematics as some as an idea over here gets applied to a set of structures over here. Consider, for example, uh, in quantum mechanics, there's, a, there's an idea that was picked up from Hilbert, uh, David Hilbert, famous mathematician at the very beginning of the 19th, uh, 18th, uh, 20th, 20th century, called a Hilbert space, called a Hilbert scare quote space, in which, and that scare quote space has scare quote infinitely, scare quote, many, scare quote, dimensions. And in those infinite dimensions, there are vectors, scare quote again, that get summed, that can be brought together in a finite sum. Scare quote all because it's dimension, first of all, we think of dimension as in, a, in the spatial sense of, you know, up, you know, sideways, depth, you know, that sort of. In a mathematical context, dimension is a degree of freedom. How many different ways can these element aspects or characteristics of this structure interact independently of one another? Three, then there's the dimensions of three. In a Hilbert space, there's 
no finite bound to the, uh, to the freedom of the individual characteristics. But it turns out that when in the way, the way sums are produced, any one of these, character, these things can be brought together, you still end up with a finite sum, which is why it has physical application, the possibility of physical applications. But it is a space, only in a kind of a, in, in, by courtesy, by courtesy of a metaphor with certain other linear forms of combination that originally derived from Euclidean actual space. But the novelty of that application, when David first, when David, like I knew him firsthand, when Hilbert first um, proposed it, it was very novel and it was weird. And no one quite knew what to do with it until uh, it was von Neumann who actually showed that Hilbert's spaces provided a background in which uh, Heisenberg and Schrodinger's different formulations could be translated into a Hilbert space in such a way that they were both of quote, here again, scare quote, the same. The infinite in all directions thesis. And um, so the novelty is the thing that's going to suddenly turn, because nobody wants to keep doing the same thing. I mean, there was a time when uh, People discovered that, uh, oh, you could talk about infinite uh, groups. Uh, Sophus Lee, uh, Dutch. Um, that was really novel when it first came up, because that you, again, because the rotation, there's no finite limit to the number of the sub subtlety of ro ro rotations of this cup, even though there are fi only finitely many uh, gradations my hand can, might be able to manage. Um, originally, that was very novel. And it was very interesting because, wow, how impossible must it be to give a characterization of something that has infinite, an in, infinite many degrees of freedom? Well, it turned out it was easier than giving the, than characterizing the finite groups. They they've been working on finite groups since Galois first talked about them, and they only find, and they only came up with a an actual character, the, the final characterization of all finite groups uh, about 35, 40 years ago. So 150 years they were working on it. Um, same thing with uh, well, topology, uh, working on you know, spaces of different dimensions, uh, solving certain kinds of problems with, uh, four, with five, six, eight you know, finite dimensional you know, the hardest space to characterize was four-dimensional. Because they kept coming up with novel problems that just didn't appear when you had fewer than four or more than four. So the novelty does, that's the real springboard to the interest. And then the interest then becomes, well, can we work with it? Can we do something with this? And do something for mathematician means, can I develop this idea in some coherent way? And when you start finding more and more interesting ways of developing this novel idea, then everybody starts jumping into that novelty, getting into it with the interest, until everybody solves all the problem and it ceases to be interesting because there's nothing novel left to do and they can move on to something else. We have to draw this to a close because uh, we've got to move on to our final paper. Take five minutes, but thank Gary.